Thank you, everybody, uh, for making to Bilbao, and uh, thank you for everybody that is attending virtually uh, the event. Uh, my name is Hanne Garcia. I'm Global Telco Solution Manager at Red Hat, um, and I, as well, the uh, Red Hat representative at the Marketing Advisory Council at the Lino Foundation Networking. I have been in the industry for more than 20 years, and I refer to the telco industry. And I have been uh, participating and contributing on the Linux Foundation and working for the past six years, I remember well, more or less. Um, I get an invitation from, from, uh, from the Elephant Networking um, in say, can we address some topics around you know, what is coming? And, and, and RP did a, a good job on presenting you know, where we are today and where we are going as well tomorrow. I just wanted to give it a little a step further and going into what we are today into what we call the, the 5G era. Um, we're still, and, and we are already starting to look into what the 6G era is gonna look like. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to walk you through a little bit into why, uh, what this uh, generation of network is and, uh, and where we are going. And as well, uh, trying to understand what the Linux Foundation has been uh, Lino Foundation Networking have we playing a role and how they will play a role in uh, in this uh, new um, destiny uh, that uh, that is uh, the decennial law that we call it in in telecommunications uh, as how the generation evolve. So I will not going to go back all the way to when the thing started because I was at the university at that time and uh, I was holding I, I I was fortunate because I was holding. Uh, is I remember well, it was uh, uh, France Telecom, uh, uh, one touch DSM uh, at that time. Um, and, but we have advanced on technology on the generations uh, through the decades. Uh, we are now, as I mentioned, in today living uh, the, uh, the introduction of the 5G networks that have been deployed across the globe. Um, there is more than 200 networks live. 5G uh, networks live in the world. That is uh, getting into now what we call the, uh, the industrialization of the, of the network. So with 4G, what we have seen is that there is a lot of uh, introduction of, with the smartphones and applications and so on. On the 5G, now we are seeing not just that we're gonna enjoy this enhance the broadband, but we are seeing as well the introduction into other markets, especially on the enterprise. And we are seeing uh, things like um, private networks as well coming up, uh, enjoying the, the capabilities that are provided on the, on the 5G uh, generation. Now, if we look for it, and again, we are, today we are still on the research phase uh, of the 6G, but we're still looking into what the 6G network is gonna be and what the promises of the 6G network we expect to be regarding with extreme uh, broadband, uh, mobile broadband, um, moving on to one terabyte uh, of, of capability in terms of bandwidth. That is just uh, enabling or looking to enabling what we're gonna call um, the enhanced communications. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are just on the, on the starting phase. Uh, we are looking into the research phase. There is a lot of white papers out there with a lot of information uh, from different actors into the telecommunication world um, that is bringing us a lot of information on what you expect, what the challenges are going to be on 6G, and, and as well some, uh, some pieces of technology that will be required. Uh, for 6G. I, I just to grab a, a few of them and, and I, I leave the sources for you guys to, to check them up uh, in detail. Uh, but we have good information coming from Orange, Docomo, Samsung, Nokia, you know, um, all these actors out there. There is many more uh, that uh, is worth reading as well. But one thing is clear is that when we're looking at 6G, and this is what is, we get from, from all these uh, white papers and, and materialists out there, is that we are gonna leave and we're gonna move towards a digital world. And, and what that means, that means that we're gonna be in, in a complete different way of communications. We are expecting to be a massive communication with networks. We're expecting to be immersive communication networks. And we're expecting so much capabilities out of the network. And for that, technology needs to be created. 
There is already work in progress in terms of technology, but there is much more technology that is required in order to enable those capabilities on the 5G, on the 6G network. Um, and I took it the challenge of taking at least a couple of, of them in terms of, you know, what are we seeing uh, as, as, as a common denominator in, in what the research is and, and, and what is coming is, um, just to name a few, uh, the inter-terminal uh, transmission and reception. So we expect the communications to be more dense and we expect device to be talking between each other to coordinate how things should, go, should work uh, between them and between the network to accommodate uh, a much more density into, into the network and creating communication paths into, into those devices. There is the non-terrestrial access and we are not talking about uh, putting, uh, <laughs> putting antennas in the moon, we are talking about bringing all the satellites, uh, the communication that um, capabilities on the satellite into the network that we know today uh, in the terrestrial side, so that we could have this, uh, this uh, truly global coverage um, for, uh, for communication. We know today that there is a large part of uh, uh, people living in, in Earth that are not connected to the network. And I think the last number is more than 3 billion people that is on that condition. And we expect that, you know, thanks to the non traditional access, we will be able to provide coverage for those. And there is one other thing that is coming as well as a recurrent topic, in, and is the cognitive network. So we expect the, that by the CG, 6G time, uh, networks uh, will be more intelligent um, in order to improve the energy consumption, in order to optimize the performance, in order to ensure that uh, services are available on the right moment, the right time, uh, on the right place. And all of that comes with, of course, as I was mentioning, introducing new technologies from the ground up. Um, we have seen already how we have built 4G, 3G, 4G, uh, 5G today, and uh, we are just uh, in the starting block to start building the 6G. We expect uh, specifications around 6G only to start. Uh, the work for the specifications should be started around 2026, so we're still three years ahead of that. But we are seeing already that with 6G, uh, 5G and 5G advance, where we are moving towards. One interesting thing that I get out of all this uh, research uh, that I was going through for preparing this, uh, this presentation today, and, and there are three topics that uh, I, will call, I will call principles that come around. Um, and one of them is, of course, cloud-based. Um, in every single white paper, every single research that you're going to look at there, it is made clear that 6G is going to be a cloud-based. Uh, infrastructure network, and and that gives us a lot of, I think, uh, a lot of um, toes and, and and good things. That this is something that we have been building from the past uh, decade as well, with the introduction of network function virtualization and seeing that um, all these networks, uh, the next generation network, will be you know based on that foundation. Uh, this is something that is very interesting for us on the, uh, on the open source uh, communities. The other, the other thing is open. You hear and you read all the time, and you're gonna, you, when you go through this material is that it's open source. We expect more and more contributions for, from the open source community into 6G. And this is something that is not only to, to help on the interoperability, but as well on the life cycle of the network and how we build the component, the software component for that network. And the last and not least is, is shared. So we're going to be seeing a network that it will be shared on infrastructure. Um, it will be shared on a spectrum. Um, so, and we probably going to see for the first time a network that is actually a mesh of networks. Uh, because when we are thinking about uh, massive communication, uh, immersive communications, um, there will, will be more collaboration need between the operators and the networks out there, not only on the public domain, but as well on the private domain, in order to 
to achieve what we are expecting for 6G. Now, um, one thing is I didn't come here to talk about technology on 6G. I did come here to talk about how the Linux Foundation can help and is being supporting uh, that path. So I, I have a long thought on to, on to where, where we are and what have I done and, and what still need to be done. And, 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 and I come with a few topics that I think is, are important for uh, supporting the evolution towards 6G. Um, and yeah, it's, and I think it's, it's something that we have been doing. I, and I'm gonna go into that on the presentation anyway. So um, topics like collaborative environment, creating the sandbox in order to help and, uh, um, and, and on an open source way uh, contribute into what the technology will be. Innovation and experimentation. RP was mentioning, and, and I'm gonna make an emphasis on that, onto all the work we are doing um, on, on that aspect. Integration technology as well with the 5G blueprint. Uh, standard and interoperability, orchestration automation, and last but not least, education and awareness. That is very, very important. Now, while I'm gonna go through that, I, I would like to bring you down to the memory lane and uh, remember where, where, where all things start. Um, I joined a, a team, a small team it was at that time, 2017. It was an OpenStack uh, summit in Boston, actually, that uh, we take a challenge into bringing what we was at that very beginning, the network function virtualization infrastructure into reality. You say, how can we actually do something with this infrastructure? What the operator is, is uh, complaining about all these things that is, uh, are almost impossible to do. And we took the challenge to actually build something that we call it at that time, the virtual central office. Say, can we actually do what we say we can do with network function virtualization? And this is a few months after we were in Beijing, in, in Beijing uh, at the OPNF <laughs> summit. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a long, a, a long road for the name of the event, uh, but, uh, and we actually, that was the first demonstration uh, where we have capabilities for the central office and central office for those uh, who knows it, you know, is, is, is those locations of the network of the operator network that is closest to you. I, I probably gonna call it, uh, and I think I'll be mentioning is, is the provider edge, is I remember, or service provider edge. All right. Um, so, <laughs> And we took that challenge and we actually showcased live on, 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 the, um, on, the, um, on the podium how we can bring enterprise services and fixed broadband services to our network uh, virtualization platform using open stack at that time. Um, we didn't stop there. And this is, this is, this is the important thing that on, on the community, we, we, we regroup and say, yeah, this is great. Uh, fixed network are great, enterprise services are great, but what about the mobile network? I say, okay, we took the challenge to say, well, next by next year, we're going to build, again, a reference architecture for that mobile network. And, and that was the time for Amsterdam. And now we open Network Summit in Amsterdam in 2018, and we demonstrate for the first time a complete um, uh, mobile network, 4G, at that time, uh, network uh, running on, on OpenStack uh, with components from Open Compute Project um, and open source uh, project as well. And we have, for example, we have the open air interface at that time, bringing the radio components for that network. And we demonstrate that live uh, in, the, um, in the show uh, at the event. And after that, there was a uh, uh, there was a, a bigger challenge. Uh, the bigger challenge is there was a change, and this is on the NFB. Uh, I think that there is a slide that represents uh, how the NFB has been evolved, the model has been evolved, and there is a shift on technology when we start seeing Kubernetes as a truly cloud native platform. And we took that challenge too, and we say, I think we can do it. I think we can, we, can, uh, we, have, we have the technology, we have the community, we, we can do it and we try. And on 2019, uh, at KubeCon, 
uh, that was in San Diego at that time. We actually present the very first uh, 5G network that was completely containerized uh, on Kubernetes. And that was even distributed because we have actually on San Diego, in San Diego, we have the site, we have the radio site and part of the core there. And the other part of the core was back in Montreal. Um, it was uh, a challenge. It was a big enterprise. But at that time we have created, we have a community that was more than 11 organizations or 12 organizations working together more than 100 people working together into those experimentations. And, and this is what is critical, that we have that environment, that the LFN create that environment for us to try these technologies, to put those technologies together. And to make a reference, and, 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 and Arpit mentioned before, um, and that is where things like the 5E Super Blueprint are key, that enable that environment that bring all the community together, that bring all those elements, uh, open source, uh, closed source, enterprise, other organizations, public organizations together into realizing something that could bring value for the industry. And that is something that um, is not only important for what we are doing now, but it's important and even wanna be more important for what we're going to be doing on 6G. We didn't stop there. We did just to build things. We shared that knowledge. Uh, there is a series of publications. Sorry, I didn't put the latest publication here. It's, it's a very old slide. I apologize about that. But there is, has been a lot of publications. And we are trying to communicate that knowledge that we have acquired uh, through those enterprises that we have uh, on those challenges that we have gone through. And there is many things that have been gone back to the open source communities as well. You know, uh, when we think that today we are at, uh, at the deployment of, of, of 5G and we know that all, most of all de those deployments are based not only on NFB model, but are based on, on a Kubernetes platform. And we look back at 2019 when we, we actually first demonstrate this is, this is where we think things happen. We demonstrate that that technology was there and the capabilities were there. Capabilities have been increased on that platform today. That is running 5G networks, live 5G networks. Most of you today probably are connected to those networks and using that technology. So as I have a list of, uh, uh, of points, we, we, we covered it the collaborative environment, we covered the innovation experimentation, uh, we're covering as well the education and awareness that are critical today and are critical for, for tomorrow. Um, there, is an, an, um, there is more than we're doing in terms of integration. There is new projects coming up, like uh, Project Silva, that is aiming to creating, uh, homogenizing the telco cloud. Okay, looking into how we can, we can have a common platform across operators that can be leveraged for, the, for everything in the telco, the edge, the, uh, uh, the core, and, uh, and the radio access network as well. And, and, and very important that, uh, and the, I think there will be a panel on this uh, later today uh, talking, and so I'm not gonna go too much in detail, but one important thing is that on the LFN, we started uh, with OPNFB and CNTT and that become Anucad. And today we are, and this is important, that we continue that integration between those projects. We continue into bringing more value of, out of what we have been doing and what we have to do for, not only for what we are living today, but as well what we're gonna be living tomorrow. So I look forward as well to see much closer collaboration, I think, uh, probably uh, that's going to be talked later today, but uh, th there is this kind of thing that make uh, the integration of technology not only within the LFN but uh, with outside products as well that make uh, very important uh, steps towards that goal of um, not only 5G but 6G as well. So we have the integration of technology added to the list right now. There is orchestration automation. Um, this has been a very 
long topic uh, of discussions uh, for a long time since the NFB model appeared. Um, and on the LFN, we have now uh, two uh, critical projects, that is ONAP and EMCO, uh, that has been there for a long time and has been bringing the basis and the layering for many of, um, of the technology that is out there. Open source projects there is, that has given uh, birth to um, commercial products, enterprise products. Um, but we don't stop there. There is, uh, and I think uh, there will be more information during, during the week on that uh, with Nephew uh, as well. That is coming to complement uh, all those efforts that we have been doing. And we, I hope to see as well uh, how the collaboration between all those projects are going to happen to bring, you know, uh, not only the knowledge that we have and, and all the experience that we have through, through the years, into what we are looking into a cloud native orchestration and automation tool like Nephew. So there is, there is already work that is being done as well on orchestration automation. The last piece and not least is um, the standard and interoperability. And I think RP did a, a good job in, in presenting that today on where we are on that regard. And I, and I agree with Rani. Uh, as well as, as I agree with RP, is a um, open source is there uh, and it play a role in, in, in the advancement of, of communications as the, the standard for communications. Um, we are seeing more and more close interactions between the open source communities and the standard bodies that we look at uh, whatever is uh, Broadband Forum, Etsy, 3GPP, TM Forum, GSMA, and uh, how they are more and more collaborating and, and looking at the open source communities uh, to help into the building uh, foundations for the next generation of technology. Um, one thing that is a kind of very interesting um, to, to name, and that is where we see the, the, the joint collaboration between those bodies is uh, the camera project where the actual GSMA and the Linux Foundation come together to build and to define the specification for the APIs that developer will be using towards um, so that they can uh, leverage all the network capabilities, 5G networks or 4G networks. And I hope the 6G is gonna be part of that. Um, but it's clear today that we are seeing uh, communities out there, the Linux Foundation networking as well is playing a key role. Arpit mentioned it this morning uh, clearly and, and, and we are collaborating and closely strengthening our, our uh, collaboration with those uh, entities out there. So while I look at all these points and I say, well, I think we are in good shape. We are in good shape into what we are doing today. We are in good shape. Into, we continue on those efforts, on, on building those collaborative, creating those environment for collaboration, for innovation, for experimentation. Continue the integration, the blueprints that Arapi was mentioning, 5G sort of blueprint, uh, that collaboration with the standards, uh, the work that we're going to be doing in orchestration automation, and continue continuously sharing that knowledge out there, out of the community. Uh, toward the industry is very, very important. And, and just to go back to uh, one of the topics that, that, uh, um, that I mentioned in terms of technology that we're looking at, and, and I'm gonna, probably gonna, gonna bring that, that now, the cognitive networks, which is, I believe is, is gonna be something that um, we need to put some focus on. Uh, why? Because where we're looking at cognitive networks on the term of 6G, we actually probably going to need that, at least some of those capabilities now, as we are densifying 5G and, and we're moving to 5G SA. Uh, and we will look down into what the foundation are, what do we need actually to build those cognitive networks uh, beyond the work that is going to be doing probably on the, on the LFAI is in order to build those capabilities, those cognitive capabilities, we require um, more precise and more deep 
observability capabilities in the platforms. Okay, and this is something that sometimes uh, we uh, we don't see on the first step, but now we are seeing it now. And there is where projects like eBPF and projects like Open Telemetry will going to help us out on that. Um, there is distributed intelligence. Intelligence will not just be sitting in one place. On um, the future of networks, intelligence will be distributed. It will even be sitting on the user edge. Um, and for that, we need capabilities. We need to be able to orchestrate that distribution of intelligence across the network. Trusted execution. So as we expect that data will be uh, uh, treated locally uh, at the edge of the network and the, or at the and, and, and trying to to come back to the to, to, to the right words uh, the right uh, definition uh, the network edge uh, the network provider edge and the user edge so we're going to need capabilities to make sure that the privacy and security are there so we're going to need uh, environments that are trusted for the execution of those capabilities and that is technology that is we have in here about uh, confidential computing that's going to evolve into that and we're going to see the the introduction of those capabilities as well and as we are working on the 5g super blueprint as well um, introducing those capabilities and there is the last and not least in order to build the models and to make sure that to have the right model we're going to need an among us amount of data data that um, it is for regulation purposes difficult to have or simply because it doesn't exist. 6G network doesn't exist yet. 5G network are just building up, deploying, but we don't have yet that amount of data that is required in order to build and to, and to, um, to build those models, the cognitive models for the network. And this is where um, Technologies like uh, synthetic data make, and you're going to be hearing that a lot, uh, probably in the in the in, in this year and, and coming years, is is a way of helping generating the data that we're going to be uh, using to train those models tomorrow. So all these pieces of technology that are there, and all these pieces of technology that still need to be built, this is where the Linux Foundation networking has still have. A role to play. Um, as such, this is what I believe that the development of technologies for CG uh, will require collaboration, and that is clear. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm convinced that the Linux Foundation is playing a, an important role on supporting that evolution. And with that, I will thank you uh, for being here today and thank you for everybody online as well. Of course, we have questions, <laughs> and I'm happy to have questions. We take first uh, on prem. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, you might have to repeat the questions. Yes. Uh, yeah, I will do my best. Uh, so you mentioned trust uh, on the on the last slide here. So I know that there's technology around confidential computing. They even have a session later this or a meeting later this afternoon. Uh, oh, maybe. Yeah, that will be better. Uh, and the public online is, is, is uh, yep. Uh, this will be streaming as well, okay. Yep. Then you don't have to repeat it. Uh, so so I, you mentioned trust around, around all of this data, right? And I know that there's technologies that people have been building for the cloud, confidential computing, and they even have a session late this afternoon today here. So um, I wonder, do you see this stuff as sort of being a, a requirement to actually have that far out at the edge as well in terms of having you know, leveraging the confidentiality from confidential computing, or I, I do see I do see the the confident the trusted execution environment as a requirement. Uh, confidential uh, computing is one of the capabilities, indeed. Uh, probably we we might need others uh, that we don't know yet, as we, as we just starting with uh, confidential computing. Uh, but this is this is uh, it is clear that. As we distribute logic, as we distribute uh, uh, the, the power of processing towards the edge, 
And we expect that processing to happen there. We expect those environments to be trusted. The same way we are trusting internally the networks in the data center, we need to trust the networks that is uh, sitting on those edge locations. And sometimes, and this is going to be the most difficult part, when those networks are not anymore, or those component of capabilities of the network not, are not anymore on the, uh, on the proper network, uh, as we know on, from the telco point of view, but those are on-prem on the user land. Okay, and still we be able. One case, one, one typical case is the private 5G, for example, right? The private networks, and when we actually have private networks that are uh, not going to be supporting only on-prem uh, uh, users, but as well the thinking of, oh, I have my employees on the company that need to get outside of the site, and when I, they move in and they move out, they are roaming from a public network into a private network. And that bring a new series of requirements. And this is where we're gonna be seeing that exploding when we're gonna be talking about more densification with 6G. So trust environment for execution and processing of data uh, is, is, is a key requirement into building that technology. Okay, thank you. I think we have another question on the room. So it's on the cognitive networks, right? You talked about how do you see the AI networks and cognitive? I believe there is a little bit of a difference in terms of human intervention and things like that. But how do you see the journey on how we kind of align? Because I, I mean, at the end, OK, so I'll rephrase my question. Where we are today is we have projects like ONAP that are intent based. So we got to about 80% of AI, I would say. Mm -hmm. We can learn and we can make decisions without, I mean, automated decisions, right? So then how do you see from there to a fully AI-driven network, right? And how do you incorporate the cognitive part of it, right? And again, it's a tough question. I, it's, I know, it, it but is, it is a, just your thoughts on that. No, Sorry. no, no. I, I get I, because I'm also trying to figure it out. <laughs> and, 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 and we are all. We are all trying to figure it out. Um, uh, so, and, and, and the question is basically is how we, how we go from today supervised, human supervised, supervised intelligence in the network towards a fully autonomous intelligent machine. And this is a, this is as a, um, a big leap of faith into, into the, you know, trust the machine, right? Uh, we are not there yet. We are not there yet, but, but we are getting there. We are getting there. So. There is a lot of work that is being done on the TM Forum around that specific topic. Uh, there is a lot of thought into how we move from this horizontal AI that we have today, which uh, there is a lot of uh, um, excitement around generative AI, right? How we can use that on the telco industry. Uh, well, give you an example. Today we need for making sure that we are building a, a, a stack, a blueprint or a stack, or a stack for telco for the, for the cloud and that cloud to be homogeneous. We need to test it. Anuket will bring pieces of that, right? How we bring AI, generative AI into Anuket so that those tests are actually generated, right? This will be a very first step and then towards trusting what the, what the foundation and how the stack is being created. And then we layer up. I do not believe that tomorrow uh, we're just going to trust the machine by the sake of trusting the machine. Uh, there will be human uh, intervention. There will be still human intervention. But that intervention will be more or less reduced than this is today. Uh, I will, but that as well depends on how good is the data that we have to build those models that, as I was mentioning, that's a problem today because, you know, the data is either not there or highly regulated. So it's, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, but as, as we get to there, as we get there into having that data and that's uh, more precise and, and more um, qualitative data, then those models will be helping us into reducing that human intervention. Uh, but that is, again, 
it's a build process. I, I don't think we are there yet. No, but I, I think that's what the board and the community is very excited about. So yeah, I, th I think a lot of communities are exciting about, and, and this is part of the work, right? Us as, as, as the yeah. elephant staff into thinking and reflecting and say, hey, maybe we start here uh, into how we bring in, uh, of course, bringing AI into orchestration makes total sense. We are seeing AI ops uh, models going all around. Uh, and I was mentioning one thing that is critical to that is the, um, the telemetry and be able to actually get the information. Uh, there is a lot of work that's been done as well on the MGMN around that today. We are working collaboratively working with them into not only the aspect of the network and the network configuration, but as well the, ener the energy consumption, right? And trying to uh, address all these topics into what is needed to actually to feed the machine uh, information. And I think we have some questions from uh, the audience online. Uh, yeah, there's uh, one or two more questions. Um, so I think you talked about this a little bit, but um, what sort of data does LFN need to have to train AI? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> so is we're looking into, for example, uh, we were mentioning uh, on app and Emco and, and Nephew. Um, so certainly we're going to need information about, about the network itself. Um, there is a lot of information that's already, so when we're looking at ORAN and what the ORAN is doing and, and how they are getting information into, into the rig to build the X apps, that information, we're going to need that information for us in order to understand how we can better orchestrate the workloads into the whole network, not only on the data center, but as well on the edge. So I hope that answered the, the question. Yeah, I think so. And then we had another virtual question was, if, if, if I'm a solutions company, which LFN projects should I be contributing to? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we have, we have the, the answer. So if you are, and, and this is, uh, I think I should have closed this as, as a good member of the Mac. Uh, if you are up there listening and not yet participating, please join. And this is the most important part, join. Even though you are only contributing to translating document, okay, or 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 just uh, I will say not just because that's an important thing, or actually providing requirement. This is very important that we get requirements. We cannot work without them. So providing requirements already contributing. And when I come to, to the question online question, say join. And one of the environments that you, you should be looking at right now is the blueprints and the 5G super blueprint is one of them. Any other questions in the room? Thank you. Thank you very much.